Welcome to the Standing Up to Pots podcast, otherwise known as the Potscast. This podcast is dedicated to educating and empowering the community about postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, commonly referred to as POTS. This invisible illness impacts millions, and we are committed to explaining the basics, raising awareness, exploring the research, and empowering patients to not only survive, but thrive. This is the Standing Up to POTS podcast. Hello, fellow POTS patients and super people who care about POTS patients. I'm Jill Brooke, your horizontal host, and today our guest is a physician whom I admire so much for his breadth of knowledge, his deep thinking, and his commitment to scouring the research for ways to help complex patients like us. Whenever he has a new publication or video out, it is always something I rush to because it's always something incredibly valuable. Dr. Gregory Plotnikoff is the founder and medical director of Minnesota Personalized Medicine, He is a board-certified internist and pediatrician. He has received international awards for medical research and teaching. The Minnesota Press has called him, quote, one of Minnesota's best brains. And he has a really interesting background. Before getting his medical degree, he earned a degree from Harvard Divinity School. He helped establish the Center for Spiritu- Spirituality and Healing at the University of Minnesota, where he served as its first medical director. For six years, he served as an associate professor at Kyo University School of Medicine in Japan, where he studied, researched, and taught in Japanese the Kampo herbal medicine tradition. While in Japan, he was active in East-West medical integration issues with the Japanese Society of Oriental Medicine, National Geographic, and the World Health Organization. How cool of a background is this? Dr. Plotnikoff is a highly cited author. He's a published expert on things like vitamin D, the gut microbiome, IBS, and so much more. Dr. Plotnikoff, thank you for joining us today. Yo, thank you so very much. It's a great honor to be here, and, and I'm looking forward to fun in our dialogue today. Yay, wonderful. I'm wondering first if you could talk more about how you have written that you went to divinity school before medical school to better understand human suffering. Okay, so maybe not the fun topic that we're going to get to, but (laughs) can you talk about what made you decide to do that? Well, it was a very conscious decision to postpone. And the reason came from actually having been a hospice volunteer during college. And I got to work with great nurses and chaplains. And it really sensitized me, oh, there are so many dimensions of what it means to be human. And if I want to be meaningfully helpful for people, medical school may not necessarily fulfill all that. And I really want to study world cultures and religions, medical ethics, but most importantly, pastoral care. I went to train as a hospital chaplain and really understand how I can connect and be meaningfully helpful to people who are in the midst of suffering and then start medical school. That's so interesting. And I know that one other thing that you have spoken about is fast and slow medicine. Do you mind talking about what that means? And does that stem from what you're talking about, trying to be most helpful to patients? Oh, yes. There is this logical connection because I think everyone recognizes time-pressured health professionals. I read constipation, headache, ear, sore throat, chest pain, pressure, dynasty, discomfort. Yes, no, yes. <laughs> Who needs to foster or nourish a history? Instead, we take a history. And I don't believe in forced ownership of someone's story. But I do like co-creating a narrative or story and putting things together and fostering the environment where an aha moment can happen and where people can make connections and see the things. And very different than taking, it's really fostering or nourishing. Of course, that requires time. And yet, as I imagine so many listeners have experienced, it's hard to get to an aha moment with someone under heavy time pressure. I guess I should say, here's a bit of a particular bias I have. I think the worst term ever created on this planet was primary care provider. And the reason I say that 
is primary care is what we do for ourselves. And I don't believe in giving that away to others. Second thing is provider sounds like is a one way transaction. And I, T-Mobile or AT&T or Sprint are providers. I have no relationship with them outside of a financial transaction and they don't care one bit about me. And so the idea of using the same term for people who have dedicated a lot of time and attention become a health professional, whether it's speech therapist or physical therapist or pharmacist or nurse or doctor or chiropractor, or whoever, it's demeaning and it undermines this very important notion is that healing occurs in relationship and a provider is a one-way relationship. I go in and I get my flu shot. Okay, but maybe that's a provider. But I go in and I have a concern that is important, maybe even shameful. It's like, I don't want to see a provider. I want to see someone in a relationship. And so honoring the fact that there's a profound difference between curing and healing is actually really important. And healing is something that requires relationship and requires time. And we have a focus now on a very fast provision of algorithm-based treatments that are health professional dependent, which can disempower people. I guess this is just another bit of language I feel really strongly about. In our clinic, we never use the word help. So people are forbidden to ask the question, how can I help you? Our focus is on how can I be most helpful? And maybe you can recognize there's a big difference in the power between how can I help you and how can I be most helpful? And we're a clinic that is dedicated to be meaningfully helpful. That is, again, focusing on empowerment rather than disempowerment. It's a reflection is different than the, the quick, fast medicine that so many people are so painfully familiar with. But the idea is, is actually true healing. You know, we, we can cure a heart attack, so to speak, but to heal a broken heart isn't done in five minutes. It's not done by a stranger under most circumstances. That's why I love hearing you speak because you are so thoughtful about some of these things that I think most people never think about. And I think that's reflected in the team that you have created at your medical practice. Can you talk about who all you have involved in a patient's care? Well, everyone in our clinic, no matter what role they play is part of it, we consider ourselves a healing team. And that's very intentional and part of our, at least twice weekly, ritual that we do, where we gather in a circle, we, we set forth our intentions. And I brought back a special handmade bowl from Japan that has a particularly deep resonance. It just boom, and has this heartbeat as it resonates, which is so cool. And we gather around it. Pre-COVID patients would be more likely to be in the office. We include them in the circle and set intentions verbally out loud for them. And oftentimes, it would be a new patient on a Monday morning, for example. And then with intentions, that this is what we say as a group, or one person leads, but it's a group shared experience. That is, today and every day, for all who are here, for all who come here, and for all in the service of healing, may we be filled with the light of love. May we be guided and shown the way. May we be granted strength and wisdom and the capacity in our every act to foster health and healing in our world. And then we ring the bowl, boom, and take a moment to ground ourselves. And then our mission is actually to then live up to that. And so everyone participates in that, and whether they're scheduling or accounting, but everyone's got to see themselves as playing a very important role in creating a positive healing and space for everyone who comes. The, the suffering that comes into our doors is quite amazing. And part of that is the suffering of being discounted or dismissed or denigrated or dumped, but people can come in discouraged and depressed. And our mission is to not 
reproduce any PTSD that people may have experienced. But we take people very seriously and we want them to have a very different experience than maybe they've had in other clinics. But we have a wide variety of people that we work with as partners, including nutritionists and dietitians and massage therapists and physical therapists, and a spiritual facilitator, a fabulous woman by the name Catherine Duncan, who is worth knowing about. So if you Google Catherine Duncan, and I think her blog is learningtolive.org. But maybe if people Google it, they'll find all kinds of interesting things. And Catherine's a particularly important part of this because as a former hospital chaplain, someone who's had her own cancer crisis in, in childhood, someone who's worked in the trauma stabilization room in a very busy inner city emergency room for four years. She has seen and done a lot and she really understands how to be meaningful in people's lives. Some of her notes sent back can just bring tears to my eyes. They're just so powerful. And my sense is that if there wasn't someone like her then people would be seeking out medical services, which then would lead to pharmaceuticals. And again, it could be very disempowering. And obviously, as a physician, I absolutely understand the power of pharmaceuticals. But our philosophy here is fundamentals first, then pharmaceuticals. As a physician, my education was pharmaceuticals first. Forget the fundamentals. They don't really matter. But I have to say the five fundamentals are really important. Breathing, eating, sleeping, moving as an exercising, and loving as a life of connectedness, a life of meaning and purpose. And those five fundamentals, gosh, there's no pill for any of them. That's why I say, okay, empowerment means gaining skills and capacity in any one or more of those five areas. You had mentioned a minute ago that you could tell stories about what it means to do maybe this type of medicine instead of maybe the traditional normal Western method. Can you see it in somebody's health when they do put one of these fundamentals into place, such as finding meaning? Like, do you have any, I don't know, any examples or stories that show what you're talking about? Well, this is one from about 30 years ago. And so I was kind of like a youngster out of school. And that was back when I was into suppressing symptoms. And I was working in inner city primary care where we worked in at least 14 different languages. Fabulous, wonderful, love, 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 love in my nine years there. And this was an early on lesson. I was seeing a woman on a monthly basis, often had multiple symptoms. And she came in one month, she's describing chest pain. And I'm just like, oh, but we've done a cardiac workup. And as I interviewed her more and more, it really sounded like reflux. And I was more than happy 30 years ago to just write a prescription for Prilosec. I said, I sense something is different this month. And I see that my next patient hasn't shown up yet. Uh, do you have a moment? And she said, yes. And I said, well, tell me, is there something new and different in your life? And she goes, yes. And I said, oh, tell me about that. She went on to describe about her brother, with whom she'd been very close, had died suddenly and unexpectedly back in their home country of Iran. And because it was Iran, she couldn't attend a funeral. So it led to a kind of conversation around funerals being for the living and then the importance of closure and honoring a person's life, et cetera. And we concluded and she came back the next month and I said, oh, how's the chest pain? She said, it's gone. I said, great. The pills worked. She went, Dr. Plotnikoff, it wasn't pills. It was poetry. And she had gone home and after a conversation and written a poem in honor of her brother in their native tongue of Farsi, had done it up in the beautiful calligraphy, had it printed up and sent to family and friends around the world. He said, and then the pain disappeared. And I'm just like, wow, what a powerful lesson. It's not Plotnikov, it's not pills, it's poetry. And so I think part of what I've seen in the decades since then is that anything that has the power to bring forth tears is worth writing about. And we've seen published clinical trials, actually, 30 minutes, three days in a row, pen to paper, writing only to oneself, no self-editing, no concern about 
perfect sentences, paragraphs, word choices, just writing flow of consciousness, 30 minutes, three days in a row, one topic, the most stressful event of my life. That unleashes some power that's not normally accessible in our unconscious and can play a profound role in bringing relief to many people. In fact, an article published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that got the editor in trouble did just that for people with chronic severe rheumatoid arthritis or chronic severe asthma. So severe that they were in maximum medical therapy 25 years ago and still symptomatic and with quantifiable measurements by airflow and other things of impaired function and fairly frequent use in the emergency room. And the result of just that intervention, significant reduction in medication requirements, improvements in all quantifiable measures, and near elimination of ER visits. What? Wait, yeah. how many days did they do this exercise? Just the three or they kept three, going? Three days, 30 minutes, one topic, just writing through himself. Why did the editor get in trouble? If there was a pill, it'd be a trillion dollar bestseller. But again, this bypasses the medical system and you can't have people getting better without doctors. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. So it just affirms that there's a whole dimension to health and well-being that is beyond pills. I worry about a culture in which there's a pill for every ill. And obviously every listener that, yes, that their experience, their challenges, you need, it's like a big pizza. You have a pizza slice for this and pizza slice for that. But what really counts is the bigger picture. You've got to develop, address all these dimensions and just focusing on one it may be necessary, but it's not sufficient. Wow. So is there any downside risk? Do you recommend that everybody try that exercise? Well, I'm not aware of any downside risk, but I am aware that anything with the power to bring forth tears is worth addressing. And sometimes it's best addressed with a partner, maybe a health professional, it might be a psychotherapist, a psychologist, especially when things come bubbling up and there's a need to process it. It's worth recognizing you don't have to put all the burden on oneself, but a writing to oneself, for oneself, about one can be very powerful. Maybe that also opens access to one's inner wisdom and it may lead someone to say, actually, maybe it'd be really good for me to work with so-and-so and so or partner with someone on this, this, and that, and that, that may be very helpful. But I'm all in favor of growth and awareness. And I say, in the absence of awareness, it's really hard for good things to happen. But with awareness, then inner wisdom can come forth. And so my challenge for everyone is, I think about the metaphorical vitamin A for awareness. And so you don't want to be metaphorically malnourished in vitamin A. So every day is a challenge to ourselves to make sure we get enough of this metaphorical vitamin A we call awareness. What a new awareness came forth today is a nice way of ending the day. I love that. Growing in awareness to invite inner wisdom to come forth. Yeah. And maybe this writing exercises or other exercises and accessing the unconscious, maybe poetry or art or other things may be really powerful for that as well. Wow, that's so interesting. Now, you work with a lot of POTS patients and also mast cell activation syndrome patients, right? Yes, and dysautonomias in general and the hypermobility and, gosh, this whole new Venn diagram of challenges where people can find themselves falling through the cracks of our current system. Mm hmm Because I guess, was it arthritis and asthma that you said was shown to respond yes. to the three days of writing? Because I guess I wonder if mast cell activation syndrome would be a little bit in the same category because it's an immune risk. Well, absolutely, because we know that mast cell activation can be driven by imbalances in the autonomic nervous system particularly sympathetic system excess. And it can also, and so high stress environment 
think about uh, the five types of stress, environmental, physical, emotional, pharmaceutical, dietary, just a high environmental stress situation can perpetuate activation. High cortisol levels can perpetuate activation or lower the threshold for mast cell reactivity. And when you think about it, I think of mast cells as being like sentinels. There are boundaries with the outside world and they've got binoculars out there looking for icebergs or they've got sniffing for forest fires. And their threshold for responding to keep us safe is going to be lower when there's been a whole series of stressful environmental things. Okay, if it looks like an iceberg, sound the alarm. We want to be safer than sorry. And so the threshold for reactivity goes down. And so it is true we can raise that threshold for reactivity when at an unconscious level and a conscious level, we know that actually the environment is safe. I think, Joe, you've probably seen things like you know, the DNRS and the Gupta program mm -hmm. and other things are cute ways of re-experiencing sense of safety. I think it's just a really important concept. And gosh, and what happens the first thing you go to a clinic, you say, well, we're going to come take your vitals. What? I don't, vitals taken? No, no, no. So here's a quick guide to everyone. Next time someone says they want to take your vitals, you say, no, you may measure them, but you may not take them. <laughs> Oh, another subtlety. Wow. Okay. So all of this is so fascinating. And I'll just let our listeners be reminded that we did have three episodes on the various forms of limbic retraining and DNRS and all of those, and they can check those out. I think it was about episodes 110. But you said something before that that I had never heard about. And you said there are five types of stress. And a lot of them made sense to me, environmental, I imagine nutritional stress means being out of balance, but maybe you could talk about those and especially pharmaceutical stress. What is that? Okay. Yes. So I talk about the five forms of stress, environmental, physical, emotional, could also be spiritual, pharmaceutical and dietary. And pharmaceutical stress would be adverse effects from prescribed medications. So, for example, many people are in beta blockers and beta reduce the capacity for our body to make melatonin. Well, melatonin is so critically important for coordination of functions. What is circadian rhythm and so much more? Melatonin has direct anti-inflammatory effects, including anti-neuroinflammatory effects, gut health, so many issues. So we think about, okay, well, what's an adverse effect that no one really thinks about? Well. Actually, loss of melatonin does cause a disruption of coordination in the system and may have other unrecognized but important effects through its anti-inflammatory activity. People may use prednisone and, gosh, prednisone uh, definitely has an adrenal suppression and the focus is on cortisol, but people ignore DHEA uh, or the blood uh, measurement form DHEAS. And Stanford rheumatologist a number of years ago found women with lupus on prednisone ran extremely low DHEAS levels. And this is a really important anabolic hormone that is a build-up hormone, which is the opposite side of the teeter-totter balance from cortisol, which is a catabolic or breakdown hormone. And both of these are important. And people say, wait a second, breakdown? No, 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 I don't want any of that. But actually, good health is a good balance of both of these. So, for example, our bones are constantly being built up and constantly being broken down. And we want both of those to be active. Too much build up, and that's Jay's disease. Too much breakdown, that's osteoporosis. We want a good balance of both. And what I found is that if the teeter-totter balance is high, high on the cortisol side and low on the DHEAS then this puts people into more of a catabolic state and they experience fatigue, muscle loss, bone loss, often weight gain, but it could be weight loss as well. But they have cognitive changes, sleep changes, mood changes, decreased libido, increased wear and tear, 
decreased resilience. Uh, so we do measure DHAS and when appropriate, uh, use short term courses of low dose support to kind of get people back on track. Um, I have seen previously healthy nurses in their 20s who were in working in a very toxic work environment. And they should be running a DHAS level of around 250 and they're running levels in the low 20s. Just, wow. Oh, oh, yes. Does that make it hard to get out of bed in the morning? Uh huh. And we found that actually changing the toxic work environment, getting them into a non toxic work environment, and getting into mind body self care, that alone and DHAS levels rose. That's a little side note among this idea about yes, every prescription drug may have underreported and underrecognized side effects. And so when thinking of differential diagnosis, I'm always thinking, what else, what else, what might be playing a role here? And so those are two ones that may be most noticeable for people with POTS. Yeah, well, I love how you just go deeper than seemingly anyone else on all of these topics and so much more detail about each drug and when I was looking at your website, one thing that struck me was that in addition to having all kinds of cool people on the health team, including massage therapists, nutritionists, people like that, you had somebody called a medical literature and evidence specialist. That just made me so excited. And then I started wondering, why have I not seen that in other medical offices? Can you talk about what okay. that person does? Well, Linda Debersen is fabulous. And she is dedicated and extremely well-read. So she's powering the PubMed for articles of interest. And obviously, no one can read 4,000 journals a month, much less 4,000 articles a month. But having Linda as part of the team can really help out. So an article we've been working on for quite some time, we've gone through a couple of different titles, but essentially about the symptomatic patient on a plant-based diet, seven questions for every clinician. She's finding articles of great interest relevant to uh, this topic. And, and so in some sense, our clinic is a learning community where everyone's a teacher and everyone's a learner. That includes everyone who comes to the clinic and everyone who works in the clinic. And Linda's role is to keep us abreast of things, keep us ahead of the curve on things. That's great. So. One of the things that I think you're ahead of the curve on is osteoporosis and treatments for it. You have published widely on that. And since many POTS patients sometimes don't get as much weight-bearing exercise because of orthostatic intolerance or maybe post-exertional malaise, is there anything that they can do to help promote good bone density as they age if they're not going to be able to do the normal like high-impact exercise? Well, I want to point out, yes, not everyone needs to do high impact exercise. And okay. so let me share a very important story. It goes back to this fundamentals first, then pharmaceuticals, and why I'm not big on everyone being on osteoporosis medication. But a number of years ago, I had this great title. I was chief medical officer of the National Geographic Blue Zones Expedition to Okinawa. And so we got mm -hmm. to interview all these people over age 100 and learned a very important lesson one day. We were going to see a woman 106 years old living on a remote island from the main island of Okinawa. And we called her daughter the day beforehand and she said, oh, I'm sorry, my mother died last week, but you can come interview me. And we already had the boat and everything. And so so we would, but she said, but I have to tell you, I'm busy. <laughs> we take a couple hours to get to this island, walk to her home, we find her just heading out to the fields to tend her gardens, where she grows her own food on this remote island. She's got this wheelbarrow. She's got a lot of her tools. And I was thinking to myself, her mom was 106. How old is she? For sure, she's at least in her mid-80s. So we walk up to her home, and because it's on an island in the area of typhoons and stuff, we walk up like 12 steps to get to her raised walk, invites us inside, of course, take off our, our shoes and step onto the tatami mats. And there's no living room furniture. You sit on the tatami mat. And she went over to a little kitchenette area and 
prepared tea for us. Now she brought this tea on a tray and this beautiful tea ball and beautiful tea cups, heirlooms, clearly things that are, are great treasures. And without skipping a beat, she holding this tray in both hands, lowered herself to the floor and proceeded to serve us tea. I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm less than half her age and I can't do that. And I thought, this is really interesting. She sat on the floor uh, every day. So she was getting up off the floor every day and she was in the gardens every day. She unintentionally was focusing on balance, strength and flexibility. Now, I take those as fundamentals before pharmaceuticals in terms of osteoporosis. So anything that one's body allows to, to focus on balance, strength, and flexibility, and I know many people are hyper flexible, but for people like me who are not very flexible, it's much more important, but maybe balancing of muscle groups would be very important. I take that as fundamental. And so much exercise can be done while on one's back. I would caution people not avoiding exercise, but doing what one can on one's back in a horizontal position is really important. And focusing every day on what is feasible and doable, maybe partnering with your physical therapist and others to, for guidance. But balance, strength, and flexibility are really key issues. And along that line, also, the Okinawan thought is that bones much more as a coral reef than a rocky mountain. And I think so much of osteoporosis thought is simplified to calcium. Bones are a very complex living ecology. And so, again, going back to fundamentals first, how is the vitamin D level? There's a whole long list of elements of a healthy coral reef that makes for healthy bones, inflammation and adverse food reactivity and hormonal status, including DHEAS, vitamin K status, which people don't talk about enough, vitamin D, homocysteine, there's a whole long list, but if I do keep going back to the, the five fundamentals, all of them play a significant role in bone health. That's so good to hear, uh, the power of the fundamentals that we all could do, but we all tend to overlook, I think. Just because there's all these fancier, sexier things that grab our attention. Oh, yeah. Yes. And that's the thing, but so many of these medications for bone health, there are hidden value judgments behind what is the absolute risk reduction? What are the numbers needed to treat for benefit? What are the numbers needed for harm? That is, how many people weighing pros and cons? I think of you know, one class of medication, its absolute risk reduction is 2%. In postmenopausal women who have already had one osteoporotic fracture, and in that population, a two percent risk reduction translates to need and treat fifty such women for five years to prevent one osteoporotic fracture. Whoa! I said that's a hidden value judgment there. Very important concept: what is the absolute risk reduction, and what is the numbers need to treat? And I'm finding a lot of people are going on pharmaceuticals because, well, it looks like you have osteopenia and for optimal bone health, blah, 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 blah. And then no one talks about balance, strength, flexibility. No one talks about nutritional metabolic status. No one talks about sleep, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's what gets me a little bit grumpy about the value judgments being shifted towards the answer being found in a pill. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I enjoy doing in the community is a lot of volunteer work as a statistician to some of the doctors who have data, but maybe don't have access to like a statistics department at their institution. But one thing you learn pretty quick in statistics is that for a lot of these drug trials, all they really need is to get a significant p-value in order to say we had significant results. And when you start really digging into what was significant and in which populations and what the effect size was, you realize, wow, there's a lot of things that can get lost when 
the drug rep says to a physician, hey, this significantly improved bone density. Like, it doesn't mean something that simple. Right. Well, notice that significant is a value judgment. The results were significant. Well, significant for whom? Significant in a statistical sense versus significant in a clinical sense, or even better, in a personal sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jill, if I take this pill, will I get, well, and that's where we kind of get into the bell curve as well. Well, on average, for most people, we can expect this type of benefit, that we only need to treat 50 such people like you for one person to benefit, and that's pretty good. You say, well, well, wait a second, are there logical options for me to consider? Or is this the only option that I have? And I think that especially when people find themselves in, an, for lack of a better term, an orphan disease category, like POTS and related concerns, on average for most people, it doesn't include people with exceptionally challenging conditions. What about the 5, 10, maybe even 15% of people who are on the left side of the bell curve? It's kind of like, are systems really addressing them? Or when systems talk about population health, that's great on average for most people. But what about people with exceptionally challenging conditions? It leaves them behind and they are deprioritized. And that's why people feel dismissed and discounted they're not in the middle of the bell curve. So that's why podcasts like this are so important. It's this kind of, yeah, we've got to take this further and seek empowerment because the systems themselves may be somewhat disempowering. Mm -hmm. And in your introduction, I think I failed to mention that you are on our board of medical advisors, but I am just so thrilled and so proud that you're on our board of medical advisors that I wanted our listeners to know that that you are just so thoughtful about everybody, not just the people at the center of the bell curve. And I don't think there's a lot of people like you. You're such a gem. Well, you're very kind. I have no idea how long I'm on this planet, but I think thanks to your hard work and the organization's hard work, there's a bigger thing happening here. And we're fostering together really positive changes. True primary care is what we do for ourselves. And so anything that we can share to empower people is going to be deeply meaningful on some level. And so kudos to you and to the Standing Up to Pots group broadly and listeners for all the work that you're doing to transform this world and empowering people to be able to feel more in control of their own health and well-being. Well, thank you so much. And there's so much more I'm excited to talk with you about someday. I know you are an expert on vitamin D and gut microbiome health, and I'm excited to ask you about the, the herbal Japanese tradition, but I know that you need to get running and get back to your patients. We're so grateful for your time and for all that you do for your patients and for the community at large. And we hope you'll come back and talk to us again sometime. Joe, it's an absolute honor. And uh, listeners, you can't see me, but I'm actually doing a deep bow before you and before Dr. Jill. Uh, so in, in this new year, I'm wishing all of you the very best of health. Thank you so much. Okay, listeners, that's all for today. We'll be back again next week. But until then, thank you for listening. Remember, you're not alone. And please join us again soon. As a reminder, anything you hear on this podcast is not medical advice. Consult your healthcare team about what's right for you. This show is a production of Standing Up to Pots, which is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. You can send us feedback or make a tax-deductible donation at www.standinguptopots.org. You can also engage with us on social media at the handle Standing Up to Pots. If you like what you heard today, please consider subscribing to our podcast and sharing it with your friends and family. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts or at www.thepotscast.com. Thanks for listening.